Yeah, I missed you. I know I saw you guys last week, but really to me it didn't count because I had actually filmed that video pre-baby and before I got a chance to edit it, she came. So although you guys saw me last week, I feel like uh, it's been so long since I've like sat down and got to film and like chat with you and it's like new and not old and pre-recorded and I just missed you like crazy. I'll put some timestamps for anybody who's like not interested in listening to me babble for a minute because I'm gonna like talk your ear off for a second because I freaking missed ya. Thank you guys so much for welcoming me back with so much love. I pretty much was in tears when I was reading all your comments. I was just like, you guys still love me. Okay, thank you. And thank you guys for welcoming Revy to our little family. I thought about it after and I should have just like added a clip in it where I introduced her to you guys, even though it was pre-recorded. Like, I don't know what I was thinking. I felt so sad because I was just like, she's here and I didn't introduce her to like the biggest part of my freaking life, you guys. And I know a lot of you guys don't have Instagram or maybe you're just not following yet. And if you're not, the link's in the description below. So if you aren't following, this is the first time you're gonna see her. Are you ready? <gasps> okay, everybody, meet Reverie. Why are you crossing? <laughs> Say hi. Reverie, meet everybody. <gasps> Reverie, meet your true crime YouTube fam. Here we go, bright eyed girl, bright eyed girl. Hi, everybody. I'm finally here. There you go. Say, okay, bye bye. Say bye bye. I'm working on a vlog. I've been working on this vlog since like February. Um, it was just gonna be like a week in February, but it's turned into, you know, bits and pieces of our life within the last couple months here. So in that vlog, I'm gonna do like a little nursery tour, show you Reverie, a little bit more about her. Come hang out with the fam, you know. Okay, before we get started, I just wanted to send a huge thank you to our sponsor for today's video, which is NordVPN. You guys know I'm a big fan of theirs. They are leaders in VPN safety and who I have been using since my identity was stolen. If you are unfamiliar with what NordVPN does, it basically acts like a shield across all of your electronic devices, so your computer, your tablets, your phone, and it basically protects you by encrypting your data, hiding your IP address and your location. For example, if someone were to hack into your computer and you didn't have this, they would have access to all of that data. They have access to personal information across your computer, your personal accounts, where you're located. So when you have this protection, your location is hidden and any data that you have pretty much just looks like gibberish to someone on the other end. I am in no way technologically savvy at all. So even though this stuff sounds super complex, it's really easy to use. You just download the app on your device and you set up your account. The really nice thing is that you can use this across all of your devices. So you can use it on your computer, your phone, your tablet. And if you have Google Chrome, it's even easier because it has a little extension browser at the top, which I love. Click on the little icon on your browser. And then from there, a drop down menu will come and you can choose from any location in the world. Once you find Find the one you want you are secured in seconds personally though aside from the protection what you guys know from the last video is that i love a vpn so that i can stream shows from other areas that i don't get right now i am over the freaking moon because i'm not even exaggerating you guys i have been trying to watch ally mcbeal for the past four years i'm not lying it's taken me four years to try to find ally mcbeal i couldn't find it on apple i couldn't download it anywhere it's not on any stream platforms and then I found it on Amazon US so I've been in my glory obviously that's like the last techie side of what NordVPN does but for me it's my favorite part NordVPN has kindly provided me with a discount code for you guys when you use my code and you buy a two-year subscription you get 70% off which is huge and so worth it but not only that they will also give you the first month for free plus there's also the added element of protection that if you're not completely satisfied they also have a 30-day money-back guarantee so that free month you can use to see if you like it but head on over to NordVPN dot com slash Sherilyn and use code Sherilyn to make sure that you are protected with their double encryption high speed servers across all of your devices. I've got the link for you in my description below making it even easier for you guys to access. Thank you again NordVPN for making today's video possible. Let's get started. Wait for it. Grab your snacks. 
Grab your drinks. You guys, I just want to let you know, I have been waiting for this moment post baby to share my first glass of wine with you guys. I'm not going to lie, I've had a paralyzer or like 10. <laughs> but I haven't had any wine. I've been holding off right now. I've been really craving sparkling rosé. So that's what we're gonna do today. This is a uh, Villa Sandy. It sounds super fancy, but I think it was like 15 bucks. Okay, let's. Babe, I can't open it. Fuck. I need an adult. Hello? I need help. I can't open it. It's about to happen. Oh. Thanks, babe. Anything for you, love. I'm just letting you guzzle in. Okay, I've been waiting for and craving this moment. Cheers, you guys. Mmm, that's exactly what I needed. So refreshing. I want to toss some strawberries in here next time. Okay, you guys, let's get into today's case. This is one that I've been wanting to do for a while, and I like it because I feel like it's one that you can also talk to your partners at home about. We've discussed it in our house, and I feel like there's definitely, like, two strong opinions. And anybody who is a boxing fan, like my husband, they definitely feel like this man was murdered although his death has been ruled a suicide. We are talking about Arturo Gotti, and if your house is not a boxing and fight-friendly house like ours, we have the fights on every single Saturday, and you don't know who he is, he's a very well-known boxer who produced some of the greatest fights in history. I think the main one that would come to everybody's mind if they are a fan would be the trilogy between Mickey Ward. Even if you're not a boxing fan, watching highlights of those fights, even you can just see like how resilient not only Mickey Ward is, but also also a Toro Gotti. It's something you gotta see. His boxing career was over 16 years. His record was 40 wins, 9 losses, and 31 of those wins being KO. And he was definitely a fan favorite, I think because of how vulnerable he was in the ring. Like he just, he put everything out there, every single ounce of himself at every fight. He also was very easy on the eyes, so naturally he had that charisma to like bring people in. One thing I think that everybody can agree on if you've seen a fight is that this this man did not give up no matter what. He would look like he was just seconds away from just collapsing and just like throwing in the towel on the canvas and he'd get back up. He'd just like keep pulling this like strength out of him and everybody knew not to ever count him out because in those seconds where you're like, oh, the fight's done, he just like rises from the dead and he knocks out his opponent or goes on to win the fight. I've seen highlights of him where he's like fighting with both of his eyes almost completely shut and still taking a win. So I think for that reason, that's definitely one of the main things that people hold on to and why they just can't accept that. If he couldn't give up in the ring, how could he have ever given up in life? Arturo was born on April 15th, 1972 in Ca Casino, Italy. Hold on. Casino. Casino. Okay, so it's like casino, but casino. So he was born in the small town of Casino, Italy. He was one of six children to his father, Giovanni, and his mother, Ida. They ended up moving to Montreal, though, when he was really young, so he was fluent in Ed Italian, French, English. In school, he was described as a star student. All of the children gravitated to him. He still had that charisma at a young age, and even teachers said that he was, like, the star student. He had really good grades, and he worked really hard. His father was an electrician, and Arturo really looked looked up to him, he described him as a very hard worker and a really good provider for the family. One thing about his dad was that he loved boxing and he loved watching it with his kids. Unfortunately, when Arturo was only 15 years old though, his father passed away and after this loss, I think a way for him to feel like he was really close to him still and like there was just that bond that wouldn't break was for him to pour himself into the world of boxing to make his father proud. As a child, he had enrolled in both boxing and martial arts, but after his father had passed, he really focused on boxing. I don't think that was the sole reason. I think that he was naturally just born to be a boxer. I mean, he was competing when he was like eight years old. 
So after his father passes, this is how he wants to help step in his shoes and provide for the family. In the early 90s, he started training to become part of the Olympic team for Canada in 1992. He was a great amateur fighter. His amateur record was 86 wins, 14 losses. He also had six Canadian Golden Glove titles. But a year before he would have gone to the Olympics, so in 1991, he was 19 years old, he decided that the amateur route wasn't best for him. He he wanted to turn pro, really wanted to pour himself into that professional caliber and step it up from what he was doing in the amateur world. For this to happen, he felt like he was going to have better success moving to the States, so he ended up moving from Montreal to Jersey City. His moniker was Arturo Thundergatti. Again, you don't need to be a fan to see the power in this guy's punches. It was absolutely insane. His first fight was against a tough guy named Jose Gonzalez, and Arturo Gatti had said in an interview that he was standing across from him in the ring, the fight's about to start, and he sees how like threatening and intimidating this guy is. I believe he had just like done some jail time or had in his life and he just like looked like that like prison fighter and Arturo was intimidated. This is going to be his first professional fight and he's like okay what have I done? I don't think I'm on this guy's level. He's all tatted up. He's got a ponytail. He just got out of jail but he knows like the fight's got to forge on like you're already in the ring. They've announced it ready to go so a bell goes and he just gives it everything he has and he ends up winning the fight. So from there it was just like the rest is his history. He started getting traction and that recognition that he was really hoping for in 1994 and that's when he won his first WBO title. And then throughout his career he won multiple fights of the year and allegedly earned in total about 30 million dollars. In his personal life, he was in a long-term relationship with a woman named Erica, and he had his first child, a daughter named Sophia, with her. His friends explain Erica as somebody who really saw Arturo for who he was and cared deeply for like that man in his soul, in his heart, and not this like pumped up persona of what often fighters have to show to bring in fights and bring in fans and all of that stuff. So she just saw who he was and really loved and appreciated just him for him. Ultimately, the relationship ended though because although she could see this nice gentle side to him, Arturo didn't do anything small. I think that ring persona kind of took over who he became and he didn't do anything unless it was like full tilt. Whether it was training, whether it was being in the ring, whether it was women, whether it was partying, everything was very exuberant. It was no secret that he was the epitome of work hard, play hard. He did make sure to keep training in between fights, but on his off days, he was ripping it up. He was described as like, there's no such thing as a last call partier. I can relate to this too, you know, like the lights go on. Some people just are those people who are like, okay, time to go home. And then Arturo, and you know, I've been known in my days as well, to be like, okay, where's the after party? I'm going on a quest for the next destination. Unfortunately, his partying didn't always bring out the best in him. He wasn't always described as like a loosey-goosey, happy drinker. Uh, there were several times that his drinking led to him being arrested. There's records of him getting into several altercations with people. One story where he ended up knocking out a guy because he asked Arturo if he was allowed to have a threesome with him and his girlfriend. When he was getting arrested for that incident, he threatened to kill the cop who was arresting him. Another bar fight landed him in the hospital because because he got stabbed in the back. There was also another bar fight that ended up leaving the other man involved permanently brain damaged. Obviously there were some issues there and this type of lifestyle, it can only be sustained for so long before everybody around you starts noticing, you know, that it's affecting not only your personal life, but your professional life too. And this was, he had some big fights that he was losing and it was really taking a blow to his ego. But instead of trying to clean things up, he went into a depression and just kind of further entered this destructive behavior. His fights were clearly exposing his struggles. He had back-to-back -back losses and people started saying that he was washed up, his career was done, he should just 
give up now. But he had a trainer who really believed in him. He came on board. He was like, you know what? We need to whip you back into shape. You can do this. And that was actually when the whole Mickey Ward trilogy started. So it showed that he had the capability to keep pushing keep his eye on the prize and like what he was doing this for which was his family to provide for them and to take over being the man that his father was and thank goodness he didn't give up because like I said that trilogy is one of the greatest things you'll see in boxing just the war that those two went through they ended up fighting three times Arturo won twice and Mickey Ward won once and after those fights the two of them became really really close there was a strong camaraderie there they respected each other as fighters and they became really great friends. One thing that I noticed that you could kind of piece about his character from interviews is that yes, everybody else saw this never give up, no stop fighter when he was in the ring, but I I do feel like he saw that in himself. But I think in his personal life, he might not have seen that strength in himself. Or maybe not necessarily the strength, but that maybe he couldn't see why he deserved the recognition that he did. He was somebody who never really understood why people would ask him for autographs on the street when they saw him. You know, he was always just like so taken back and appreciative about it and he just didn't understand like, why would they want an autograph from me? He also never saw himself as different from any of his friends. To them, he was just Arturo. I mean, I heard a story where this guy, he even babysat for his friends. He was the type who was like, yeah, you know what? You need a night out, call me. I'll watch your kids for you. And he did. So he definitely wore several different hats. Among those hats was also a ladies' man. But in 2006, he meets a woman named Amanda Rodriguez. She's 14 years younger than him. And this relationship changes everything. Amanda is originally from Brazil, and she spent most of her life there before moving to the U.S. Arturo told his friends that he met Amanda at the dog park one day and that she was a student. However, many believe that that's actually not how they met and that he met her at a gentleman's club. It was called the Squeeze Lounge and she allegedly was a dancer there. And I mean, that there's nothing to be ashamed about that. That's some Anna Nicole Smith goals right there. Meet a wealthy man, get swept off your feet, good to go. But for whatever reason, Amanda denies working there, denies ever meeting Arturo there, even though there are several employees of this establishment that are like, no, we uh, definitely worked with her. She was definitely an employee here. Regardless of how they met though, the attraction was instant, obviously. They're both gorgeous. She said she actually thought he was a movie star when they first met and she could not believe that he got his face like punched in professionally to make money. I think his friends saw this relationship initially as just a fling, you know, have some beautiful young girl on your arm to show off, make you feel youthful for a little bit. But they got pretty serious quite fast and his friends saw that coming from a possessive side of Amanda wanting to like lock him down. One friend of Arturo said that he and Arturo were out at a bar one night and they were just talking to these ladies at the bar and Amanda comes and walks in, sees this and just flies off the handle and says to Arturo, in my country, we kill men for cheating. I mean, I'm not going to deny being a stage five clinger. I will fully own my crazy. But I mean, like, you don't say that in front of witnesses, girl. Something way more effective is the like, (laughs) we'll talk later. Regardless of these red flags that other people were seeing, he proposes to her in less than a year of them meeting. He then retires from boxing in 2007 and they end up getting married a month after that. They get married at the Grand Canyon and this event is not like this huge spectacle. It was basically an elopement and it's something that caught his friends and family off guard since they weren't, you know, gung-ho about the relationship in general. This union was not entirely supported and a lot of people close to him just felt like Amanda was in it for financial gain. Those feelings are just further fueled when Amanda takes Arturo to his lawyer's office just I think weeks after them getting married and have the prenup that she originally signed to show you know Arturo that she's only in it for him and not the money ripped up. Her version of this event is that he decided to do it to show her how much he loved and trusted her. I don't doubt that there was no love between them. It's just that a lot of the stories that you hear from friends and people who are close to both of them was that the fighting in the relationship was definitely what took the spotlight and showed far more than the love. 
many of his friends had come forward and said that they've been witnesses to a lot of these arguments and they say a lot of times it's Amanda who's not scared or intimidated by Arturo in any way she doesn't just like sit back and stay quiet she's the one who is primarily verbally abusive and she hits him where it hurts oftentimes like her choice of words to refer to him as was a loser washed up she knew how to hurt him when it came to like his career and things that were really important to him by like being a winner and working hard this was her way of really really breaking him down she also didn't care for his family and often took blows at his mom and sister. Another friend saw a black eye that she had allegedly given Arturo. Amanda also admits to having a very tumultuous relationship with him. She said though that the only times they had a lot of issues and that she saw another side of Arturo and that she needed to defend herself was when he was drinking. She wanted him to quit so in December 2007 she gives him an ultimatum and says if you don't go and get help I'm gone. Which may have been an out for Arturo. He might have wanted to take that opportunity. Unfortunately though, things were complicated because Amanda was recently pregnant. So now she's got a child on route and he decides that he wants to be there for this baby, wants to try to give a family a go with her. So he agrees to go to this facility, but before he goes, he talks to his sister and he tells her like, I don't have a problem. This is such a joke. I'm basically doing this because I just want to shut her up. He does go. But he checks out after a week. Not long after, Amanda has their son. They name him Arturo Jr., which has to be like the most amazing feeling for Arturo. I think, you know, any man is just so excited when they have that baby boy to carry on their legacy. And so for somebody who had already, you know, kind of built a career and these stepping stones that he could possibly, you know, show and guide his son through, teach him everything he knows. I, I can only imagine, you know, the plans that he had in his mind for him and his son. So at this point in life, Arturo Jr. is born. Arturo Sr. is retired. They're already moved back to Montreal now. And I believe that he was working as a realtor at the time, but he was finding it really hard to adjust to careers, which totally makes sense. You know, you go from standing in these rings to these like sold out arenas, hearing people cheer your name. You're this superstar. And then now you're just like a commoner. <laughs> amongst us civilians, you know, in more of a average career. And his friends and family, they say they did notice uh, a change in him. And Amanda says that she saw it as a depression that he was going through. She said, unfortunately, the only way that Arturo knew how to cope with things and hard times that he was going through was to drink. So he started doing that again. Since they had already, you know, been down this road, Amanda said she didn't even want to try it. She couldn't deal with the drinking, didn't want to deal with the blowout fights. So they decide to move into separate places and they're essentially living apart and coming to terms with the fact that they're headed for divorce. I mean, it didn't really help with avoiding any fights or anything like that by being apart. They were still fighting and attacking each other personally. During the couple months that they were apart, Arturo even started seeing another woman named Karen and he confided in her just like how toxic the relationship was. And he said the only reason that he held on and fought so hard was because of his son and he was really scared of her taking his son back to Brazil with her and him never seeing him. Unfortunately, there was just something about the two of them that they both knew how toxic they were for each other, but they couldn't stay away. So before calling it quits for good, they decide to go on this second honeymoon. They've planned it for June 2009 and the plan is that they were going to go just the two of them and do like a little European tour together and then they were going to meet up with family in Brazil and reunite with Arturo Jr. over there. They started off in Paris and Amanda said here he proposes to her again at the Eiffel Tower by having a ring in a glass of champagne. So her version, I mean, it sounds like things are, you know, like revamping and they've got this new start. But along their travels, there's one point where Arturo calls one of his friends and he leaves the message and he says it's an absolute nightmare. It's a complete disaster and that he's probably going to be 
coming home sooner than expected and he'll touch base with him when he's back in Canada. For whatever reason, it didn't end up happening though. He did forge on with the trip and him and Amanda arrived in Brazil and they checked into room 6305 at Hotel Doraso in Porto de Galinas. The area is absolutely beautiful. It's everything you would want in a vacation spot. Nice warm beach, gorgeous weather, gorgeous people, all this stuff. Ugh. I want to go on a vacation so bad. <gasps> you guys, we need a true crime fan vacay, don't we? How fun would that be? For real, I, I, I really think that this needs to happen. Let me know your thoughts. Where would we go? All right, it's the night of July 10th, 2009, and the family decides to go to a pizzeria, and Amanda says that everything starts out fine, but at some point, Arturo starts drinking quite heavily, and she's ready to kind of wrap things up, and he wants to still stay at the pizzeria, have some more drinks, and he doesn't want Amanda and Arturo Jr. to leave him there. There ends up being a heated exchange between them, and Amanda's like, I don't want to be around you right now, so she gets up to walk away from the table, and I guess in order to leave the area that they were at there was some form of like barricade I don't know if it was like a, a large step or something like that whatever it was she had to step over it and when she took this big step she ended up flashing her cuckoo to some of the patrons in the restaurant and a few of them had laughed about it and Arturo didn't know what was going on so it's getting him more heated because he's like what the fuck are they laughing at like I said he had been drinking quite a bit I think Amanda said he had like seven beers, two bottles of wine. So he's like extra emotional and he ends up getting up and following her and they start arguing on the street in front of the pizzeria. There's multiple people in front of them that are witness to this and at one point Arturo shoves Amanda and she falls to the ground. She ends up scraping, I believe her elbows and even her chin and she says that she just gets up because she's so embarrassed that she's been pushed in front of all of these people and she just immediately walks away. Arturo flags down a cab and he and Arturo Jr. get in it and I think they only do like a little stroll around the block and he decides he wants to go back to the pizzeria and see if Amanda has made her way back there to pick her up. So when the cab driver drives back there, there's more of a crowd out front and they're telling you know all the other patrons what just happened that they just witnessed this man push this woman and now he like rolls up and they're like that's the guy so this like mob kind of comes for Arturo and he's like fighting off like five different guys at once he's getting like pelted with rocks I read that some guy threw a bike at him I also heard he broke some guy's jaw so it's like a big thing. He gets back in the cab and the cab driver sees that the back of his head is bleeding. He see, asks if he needs help. He's like, no, I just want to go back to the hotel. So that's where he takes him. Amanda had been at a nearby pub just to decompress. And then she goes back to the hotel as well. When she gets there, she says Arturo and Arturo Jr. They're already there and he's just cradling their baby in his arms on the couch. He's just rocking back and forth and he's crying. She says that they don't even have a conversation. He doesn't try to explain himself in any way. He just looks at her and he says, so I guess this means we're done. And she's like, yep, pretty much. Amanda says after that, she grabs Arturo Jr. They go upstairs and go to bed. A few hours later, Arturo Jr. wakes up. He's only 10 months old, so he needs a bottle. So she gets up to go and warm one up for him. And the condo seems like it's set up almost like a loft style. So there's like a set of stairs with like a room up there. And that's where her and Arturo Jr. are sleeping. So she goes down the stairs to warm up the bottle in the kitchenette. And on that main level is where she had left Arturo and she sees him and he's passed out on the floor. She says to her, this isn't anything unusual though, so she doesn't even think twice about it and she's still so upset with what had happened the night before that she's not even gonna wake him up to help him get, you know, a better sleep on the couch. She just like walks past him, goes and warms up the bottle and then goes back upstairs. A few hours go by, so it's like 9 a.m. now. Amanda gets up for the day with the baby and she sees that Arturo's in the same position and she's now just like annoyed. She goes to wake him up with the intention of being like, pull yourself together, like look at what you've done, I'm leaving. And she goes over to him and she realizes he's stiff, he's cold, 
and he's not breathing. As she's looking around to see, you know, what's gone on, she says she sees there's like a knife on the counter, there's a stool that's toppled over near him, and a purse strap. She says at this point she's just shaking him, trying to wake him up, he's unresponsive, she's screaming for help, and a hotel worker that hears her screams, he ends up coming to the unit. When he gets in there, he says that she's telling him that her husband fell and she can't wake him up. So when he goes over there, he's kind of expecting this guy to be like rolling around in pain from a fall and he clearly can see like the second he looks at him like that Arturo's dead. When he bends down to see if there's a pulse, he notices also that there is some blood around his head. When the paramedics get there, they say it's obvious that he's been dead for hours and this does not look like a fall like she's telling everybody. Investigators are now called in and when they get there, they see there's like strangulation marks around his neck and the purse strap that's close by him seems to fit that indentation. And Amanda tells them that now she thinks that he hung himself with her purse strap. Right off the bat, the detective is not liking her version of events. First of all, he's finding it really hard to understand why she would just walk past him when he's just like kind of sprawled out on the floor in an awkward position. He also doesn't believe that somebody would want to take their life when they're in a foreign country with their family just like right above them and also with hardly any clothes on. Another red flag to him is that Amanda tells him that she needs to prepare her son some porridge. So she goes to the kitchen and he wants to follow behind several minutes later to, you know, just keep the conversation going but low-key kind of see what she's doing and he sees that Amanda's got one of Arturo's chains in boiling water. He says that he can see that there's like skin particles like floating and on there so he thinks she's trying to remove something and like clean it up so he pulls it out of the water and he's like you can't you can't be doing this like we need to assess everything in the the unit here so he bags that up and he says she's just just continually trying to deflect any attention or questions on her and she just keeps pushing this idea that he's definitely used her purse strap to kill himself. So they've got their spidey senses tingling and they notify the family back in Montreal and they want to get a little bit of insight from them about their relationship. This actually was the morning of Arturo's sister's wedding. I can't even imagine. She doesn't want to go forward with the wedding, obviously, but it's their mother who says, you know, we need to carry on. We are going to have the rest of our lives to grieve Arturo. Today is about you, and we just need to be strong because it's exactly what he would want us to do. After they speak with the family and they learn more about the relationship and how tumultuous it is, things aren't sitting right, right white with the investigators so they arrest her. What they believe happened is that Arturo most likely had passed out due to drinking and that Amanda had taken this opportunity to strangle him with her purse strap. They did consider the possibility that maybe an intruder had come in and been the one to strangle him but quickly that was just like tossed out because all of these rooms had those electronic like key cards and nobody was in or out. I believe that it was also notified like if the door opened and it hadn't there was also no sign of break-in from the patio door so really the only people that were left in the suite was Arturo, Amanda, and Arturo Jr. When they arrest Amanda she says they've got it all wrong she's innocent and she's trying to go through scenarios to try to figure out what could have possibly happened and in those early hours she brings up to the investigators that maybe her brothers had done it for a favor for her. She then goes back and says, no, the only thing that could possibly make sense is that Arturo did this himself. The way I understand it is that in Brazil, unless you have like your full case laid out for the charges that they've arrested you for, like stat, you have to release the prisoner. That's my understanding when I was going through this case. After three weeks of her being there, they still had no idea what had happened and no case really. So on July 30th, they end up releasing her. Not only just releasing her actually, they formally announced that no charges are gonna be laid. And it's interesting because initially they had been so suspicious of Amanda pushing this suicide by purse strap and now this is what they actually believed happened. Their theory is that Arturo had used the stool that was nearby to climb up 
and attached the purse strap to the stairs and then hung himself on this purse strap and that at one point the bar stool had fallen. And then sometime after that, he also had fallen and that's why he was on the ground when she found him. When Arturo's friends and family find this out, they are like, there is no way he would have done this. They said he is just somebody who simply didn't believe in suicide. His religion didn't lead him to believe in suicide. He was a fighter, not only professionally, but in his life as well, and he just wouldn't have given up. According to multiple friends of Arturo's as well, as they were calling each other and sharing the news, there were a few of them that said the same thing and they were like, she finally killed him. He had actually had conversations with some of his friends leading up to the trip saying that he was really scared that something was in the works and that Amanda was trying to take Arturo Jr. to Brazil. She had recently got him to sign over documents for Arturo Jr. to get a passport and he just had this this fear that he was trying to, that she was trying to take him away from him. Then when they find out that Amanda had encouraged Arturo to adjust his will before they left, they are fully convinced she is the only one that was responsible for his death. I guess originally before the trip, his will had been for his daughter and his son to have all of his assets split 50-50 between the two of them. But now the new revised version was for Amanda to receive everything. With all of this and the fact that the family themselves have seen how toxic this relationship is, they end up sourcing a doctor to do a second autopsy on Arturo. The second pathologist finds out that the first autopsy that was done was actually not a full autopsy. It was a partial one and my understanding is that it's only certain areas of the body that are looked into and not just like a full scan. So if you're not doing a full investigation, clearly there can be things that you miss. He does a full autopsy on a Turo. He's going through like with a fine tooth comb because his family has privately sourced him. Unfortunately though, he doesn't come back with any more answers. His findings were that his death was caused by asphyxiation, but that means that it could have been him, but it also could have been somebody else. Since he couldn't find anything that, you know, clearly pointed a finger at somebody else, he couldn't undermine the previous pathologist. So in his report, he said he couldn't dismiss those findings in Brazil, but he did say that he did believe that evidence had been mishandled in their investigation. And because of that, he couldn't say, 100% with unwavering doubt that it was a suicide. Another question he had was that when the toxicology report came back, there was a drug called car carciprodol, which wasn't available in Canada. And I guess it's got severe withdrawal effects where you go through like a lot of confusion, heightened anxiety, signs of psychosis. So we can't be ruled out that maybe with a mix of high amounts of alcohol and this drug, he wasn't acting himself. But again, it's like when you think you have a little bit of maybe explanation or answers, there's more questions. So when it came to the blood that was around Arturo's head, the first doctor believed that that was caused because of pooling from his initial injury from the fight on the streets and that when he fell, it just kind of like re-aggravated and that was the blood from there. Whereas the second report couldn't say for sure that it wasn't also reopened by a struggle or that additional injuries were also added to it. Since they couldn't get really clear answers from a second autopsy, his longtime manager then decides that he wants to have a private investigator go to Brazil, look at the scene, go through the evidence and see if they can have clearer answers to what happened. One of the first issues that they find is that when they're conducting the weight tests of Arturo's body to the hanging of on the stairs with this purse strap, they couldn't make it fit. The dummy that they had was half of the weight of Arturo. It was only 35 kilograms and Arturo was 70 kilograms. So with this 35 kilogram dummy that they had, when, he, when they would attach it to the strap on the stairs, it would snap in five seconds and the dummy would fall. So five seconds is clearly not long enough to kill somebody. These investigators were out in Brazil for 11 months. And at the end of it, their findings were that he was murdered. They said not only was there a weight issue with this dummy that they had that was falling, but the way it fell also didn't align with how Arturo was found. 
they believed his the position of his body was just too far from where the strap would have been. And he was also like kind of tucked under the stairs. And with the test that they did, they dropped this dummy over a thousand times. And every time they dropped it, it fell forward, not to the side like he was. So they believed that it should have gone like this and he was more like this and over. The strap itself is also an issue because I think it was like 24 inches. And when they tried to put that around the dummy, it wasn't long enough to attach onto the staircase. The only way they were able to make that work was if they extended the purse straps fully and then they wrapped it around the dummy's neck. Obviously though, if this is how he did it, that's how the strap would have been found and it would have also still been attached to him and it wasn't, it was like off to the side. When the Brazilian investigators got a hold of the second investigator's findings, they said they couldn't really fully be relied on. They said that the second team that came in had tested the purse strap positioning in an inaccurate position. They had wrapped their purse strap along the beans that was supporting the handrail. So this would make the position of the body diagonal hanging over the edge of the staircase. And the Brazil team said that it was hung vertically on the actual handrail itself. So it would change the position of the way he felt. And I have two problems with that. One of them being the purse strap was on the ground when it fell, or sorry, when they found Arturo, it was on the ground. So we really don't know exactly for sure where it was to begin with. Second, it also doesn't explain the whole weight issue away. Team two's theories are that Amanda was responsible and that the injury to the back of his head was caused by her hitting him and rendering him unconscious and then taking that opportunity to strangle him. There unfortunately was no weapon found that could have supported this. There was also no blood splatter. And we also have to remember that there was that taxi driver who did say that he had quite a substantial injury after after this fight outside the bar and that he also had even left like blood like a large blood stain in the cab like on the headrest when he got back into the cab again i suppose the wound could have been re-aggravated whether he had fallen from the staircase or whether amanda had hit him i feel like if she hit him though it would have been a lot messier it wouldn't just like pool where he landed so i do think in that situation whether he fell because of somebody else or he fell because of falling from the staircase, I do feel like the whole pooling lines up with like re-aggravating that wound. I really don't know where I fall here. I feel like I can see holes on both sides and then I can also see like valid evidence on both sides. To me, it's clear why the prosecutor didn't feel confident enough to like go through with charges though. I don't think that there was enough evidence to like forge on with like <laughs> zero reasonable doubt for like a jury. The fact that that second investigation was 11 months compared to 11 days that the first team did in Brazil, it's definitely something that I'm considering holding more weight to. These guys were also very clear with the family like that their only job was to be investigators and even though they were hired privately it didn't mean that it was going to sway the decision that they made. They took it very seriously obviously. They were there for 11 months and they had nothing to gain either way. They were just there to provide a scenario of what they thought happened. Based on just the science of them doing those tests over and over and over again and them not lining up at all with the way that the crime scene was laid out that's really problematic for me and another thing that I just can't shake that being said though I don't know if Amanda did it I don't think she was strong enough to strangle him and the only way that could have happened was if he was unconscious when she suggested her stepbrothers though that definitely perked my ears up and I think that's something that should have been looked into more as opposed to her just like flying off scenarios and then quickly like bypassing it and going back to like the suicide theory. I couldn't find if they had ever been questioned or whether they had alibis, but I, I would love to know more about that side. One answer that I think might, may possibly provide some comfort to the family is that when I was watching the Aaron Hernandez documentary, they mentioned CTE. Super brief explanation on CTE if you're not familiar with it. It's basically a condition where the brain deteriorates due to high impact 
of the head and him being a boxer and getting you know punched in the head for a living for 16 years that could make some sense symptoms of cte are often depression impulsive behavior substance abuse and suicide there was a hospital record from a previous girlfriend in 2006 where arturo um, had called her and said that he accidentally overdosed on Ambien and alcohol and he was rushed to the hospital and had his stomach pumped in time. That later was kind of like backpedaled, that it wasn't intentional, not like a suicidal thing. But initially in like those early hours, he did admit that he was like in a really dark place. From what I can tell, Amanda and Arturo Jr., they still live in Montreal. I believe at one point, Amanda had opened up her own like boutique shop with um, money that she had inherited from the death of Arturo, um, but I don't think that it's open anymore. And I believe she's working at like a luxury car dealership. Arturo Jr., he is following in his father's footsteps with the passion of boxing. I had checked out his Instagram and he is so adorable. He's the spitting image of his father and he talks a lot about him on his page which is really sweet to see he's definitely you know keeping his memory alive and wanting to make him proud in what he's doing in his life right now it's really sad because clearly there's a rift between the family so he doesn't have anything to do with arturo's family i think the only member of arturo Gotti's family that does speak to Amanda and Arturo Jr. is his older brother Joe Gotti and he says that he doesn't believe that Amanda is responsible which um, has caused a rift within his own family because he still maintains a relationship with his nephew and Amanda. So yeah, lots to digest here, you guys. Lots of different scenarios and we are no further than we were at the beginning of this episode. I have no idea what the heck is going on. I want to know your thoughts want to know your theories. Thank you guys so much for watching. I missed you so much. And I just wanted to thank NordVPN one more time for sponsoring today's video. If you guys want to check them out, make sure you click the link in the description below and head on over there and use discount code Sherilyn at the checkout. Thanks again, NordVPN. If you have not already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It means the world to me. I love and I appreciate you so, so much. I will see you in the next video and I will miss you terribly until then, make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon.